what we're dealing with, as Ian has said, is models in 1160, two completed models and, and one uh, is still in the works. By way of brief background, I, I migrated to 160 when I was between workshops and wanted to be able to do something at my home office desk, which meant it had to be small. And I eventually settled on 1160 as the smallest scale in which I could still build working blocks and, and do some, some carving. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the various scales, but uh, let me show you what 1160 is. This is 1160. These are two of the chase guns from the ship that I will show you in just a moment, eight pounder, long eight pounders from the first of, uh, of the ships. I also, by way of background, should say that I uh, got interested in French warships uh, initially because everybody in the States was building basically the same ships. Uh, there were a lot of constitutions and confederacies out there, and I wanted to do something different. And then I, uh, I came across the Ankara Press series of books monographs which deal uh, quite extensively and in great detail and, and uh, a great scholarship with the French sailing navy, as well as some other uh, French uh, ships. And these monographs uh, all have really excellent plans. So this was the beginning of my uh, time with uh, French warships. I spoke, and as you will discover, I speak and read no French, but fortunately, uh, Ankara now uh, has all of its books uh, translated into English. And in the meantime, down here in the right, my uh, handy Ankara Press French English, English French Nautical Dictionary has gotten me through many uh, issues in the models. So, this is the first of the models. This is actually built to the uh, plans of the brig Le Signy but I found that the figurehead on that brig was, in my mind, very ugly, a, a giant swan with its wings spread. And so as I went forward, I decided to adopt the name of one of the sister ships, Le Curieux, and went forward with that only to discover that the only separate plan of that ship in uh, Greenwich had the figurehead torn off. And so what we have now is a hybrid brig with my own figurehead on it, hopefully representing the theme of the curious. John Garnish was kind enough to <laughs> superimpose a, uh, a scale on this, along with both American and British currency. And uh, so this is uh, the size of the finished model. And here's the same picture I can't tell from mine, but can you see the end of the boom on your picture? Because there's a little device hanging from it, which is the French attempt at a life-saving device. It was a disc of about two feet diameter uh, of wood and cork that would drop from the boom. And it had 10 ropes descended from it with knots at the end which of course would flare out when it hit the water. So the theory I think was that someone in the water could grab onto this. I don't know if it worked, but I've seen it on a number of, of French vessels. Anyhow, this is, this is the brig in almost completed form. And I have to tell you that once the brig made, made its way into the display case, it's quite delicate and I have not removed it for photography. So everything you're gonna see here was uh, shot during various phases of construction. And here we're pretty close to the end. I mounted it in a sort of a sled device to uh, help uh, with the rigging. And here is the forward view of the same situation and the stern. I would also note that I do very little, I use very little paint on these models. The little bit of blue you see there is about the most that I do except for blackening guns and, uh, and metalwork. So for, at this point, what I thought I would do is just run through a number of pictures of the ship and then with minimum comment, and then uh, come back and talk about some of the 
specifics and some of my techniques. So you will note that it's still under construction as there's various uh, loose lines about very early in the rigging process. I'll apologize for the quality of some of these where the, uh, these are all iPhone photographs. The stove on deck, I was fascinated by the number of containers in this stove, unlike two copper British stoves, you know, the French are gourmets and, and they had to have a number of different vessels. The carronades, this brig had 14 carronades and two long guns, very powerful for a brig. These are 24 uh, pounders, I should have noted. And this is my, uh, my figurehead, sort of a muse with a, with a torch looking forward, I guess, being curious. Ships, boats, a bit of the rigging. And then this last picture, before I discuss some things, uh, I put in for my own amusement. I build the, uh, most of the rigging off the ship, particularly the running rigging, and then mount the masts and the yards on the ship with the rigging uh, already on. And that results in something like this from time to time when it kind of gets out of control. And I still look at this with some amusement and wonder how I ever managed to recapture all that. But anyhow, I want to talk about a couple of the different elements of this. First being the figurehead, poor, fo poor photo of her. There are basically two types of carving or decoration work in the ships that you'll see, the two in particular, carving such as this and what I call assemblages. And I'll explain that, but the carving is boxwood done with, a, I, I install a piece of basswood in to protect the legs, which of course are separated for the bow. There's her other side. And she's just about ready at this point for installation with the arms to come. And here I was test fitting her. And uh, there is her arm, which I laughingly realized uh, it was not taken from Michelangelo's Adam, but does have that look. So, uh, and then here is uh, another bit of carving from the, uh, from the cat head. Now, the other thing I refer to as assemblages, the quarter panel drop below the, the fake windows. This is done, uh, the, the base is ebony, and I then cut very small pieces of whatever wood, in this case, boxwood, that uh, I want to use for decoration. And what I've done is I use some acrylic varnish as a base to install these various pieces. The acrylic varnish lets me manipulate the pieces a little bit. And then once I've got them where I want them and all of the pieces assembled, I flood the area, uh, the ebony portion, uh, with, with very thin ACC and then uh, mask it and overspray with, uh, mm -hmm. this is before the overspray, the spray, excuse me, with, uh, with a flat finish. So um, that's, this is the result before that overspray. And it really does kill the shine from the glue that's in there already. So that's the, the method for assemblage and you'll see more of that on the next ship. The next is coppering. At 1160, in theory, with the nail heads, the copper nail heads pounded flat, you really can't see the nail heads at all, or you shouldn't be able to, in my mind. And so uh, I've gone with a little bit of artistic license here. Having decided to copper it, I wanted to show the nails to some extent. So. These uh, nails are embossed on very thin strips of uh, adhesive-backed copper, all cut individually to, to assemble on the ship. This is a close-up of that. And with apologies, I did not photo record 
the process of embossing these, but if anybody is interested, I'd be happy to explain it uh, separately. And uh, if you have some great desire to, uh, to build in 1160 with coppering, anyhow, that's, uh, that's the coppering. The ship's boats are built the same way you would build them in 148 uh, with ribs. Uh, I have to use slots on the lower portion uh, outside of the uh, gunwale of the ship. And I also use a similar set of slots down the middle, which will be covered eventually by a keel, but that keeps the ribs in, in pretty good order. And uh, of course they are put over, I should have mentioned, they are as you would with the larger version, they're put over a mold that is in this case basswood coated with a lot of beeswax to keep the glue, which is del pretty delicately done off of, the, uh, off of the mold. So then once that is done, I uh, start to frame and I I'm sorry, plank. In this, in this case, I'm using masking tape to spile the uh, shape of the, of the plank. And so then that's the uh, end result before I've added the keel and the stem. Then I put the boat in a mold of plaster in Paris, which I've created by overlaying some very thin plastic wrap on the ship, on the boat, and dipping it into wet plaster. This gives me a way of holding this because the finished out of the mold boat is incredibly light and delicate, and there's no way to really hold it to finish the inside. So this is my, my homemade method of hanging on to the thing and, and being able to finish the inside. Guns. My guns, both this and the next ship, are turned in multiple pieces. You can sort of see the, the specific components. I've tried everything else. I've tried molding. I've tried turning with a um, device for turning, and none of it works. I have to really, in order to retain the detail, turn it in individual sections, and that's the way this is done. And the anchors, uh, also brass. I like the feel of brass for anything that's weighty. And that's what I'd use for these. They're, they're still to be finished, but they're silver soldered. Upper works. So as I said, I, I don't like using paint. I like to use the natural woods and the, the spars, uh, masts and, and yards are, are made up from ebony, bottom and top, and pear wood in between, joined uh, with pegs of, of boxwood. And uh, so these are the top mass sections uh, before installation. And similarly, this is one of the, I don't know if it's four or main, one of the fighting tops. Again, these pieces are ebony over pear wood, the outside is boxwood that's been painted, one of those instances where paint is necessary because ebony does not like to bend quite that sharply. Now, essential to all of this, when I started, I said I needed to be able to make blocks uh, in this scale. So blocks, these guys are 10 inch blocks. They're made the same way you would make blocks in larger scale drilling holes, connecting the holes to create a sheave, and uh, then shaping the outside. At least that's the way I've done it in larger scale. This, uh, these are examples. The smallest I've gotten to really is, is a six inch block, which would be these guys, and the others are larger. And double blocks made the same way. Also, you know, very small, very delicate. I, I, I hear groans. Uh, it's, uh, it's challenging, but it, it can be done. And even a triple block, thankfully, there were only a couple of triple blocks 
on this particular brig. And the, the best tool that I've come across for making these things, this is a fiddle block, is, is homemade. It, this is a number 11 exacto blade. I assume exacto means something uh, overseas, but it's a number 11 blade that I grind down and it functions as a chisel. And it's uh, really quite an excellent means of connecting those two holes. Rigging, again, I'm using various thicknesses of thread for the standing rigging. And here I do use either paint or stain to darken the, uh, those that are tarred. And I also use a stain on the running rigging because I don't like a really bright white on the model. So I, I darken it a bit with some stain. The running rigging, the, the, particularly the smaller dimensions, is mostly from fly tying sources. The uh, fly fishermen who get out and do that have some really excellent fine threads that are tough, uh, mostly synthetic, but they're tough and they tend not to break when they're under stress, which is very useful for rigging. And my favorite discovery in this, which I always share, is a Dutch thread called Vivas, which is minuscule. I, sh I meant to measure it before this, but I didn't have the chance. But it's a great virtue is that it splits easily in two and the two halves also are very, very strong. And so this is extremely useful for all sorts of things. It, 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 the smallest might be for uh, flag halyards, but it's also used for tying, for stropping, for all sorts of, of uh, uses. So that is the brig. And moving now to the Jebek. And this is, for me, a very interesting ship. This was built at, on the order, this and three other similar ships were built on the order of, of the French Marine in order to combat the North African Corsairs that were raiding French shipping, merchant shipping, and even French towns and villages. And the Corsairs generally use ships like this, or and sail-powered Jebecs, and uh, were uh, loaded with crew and were very effective. Of course, they could point much higher than a square rigger and when, when rowed uh, could go uh, directly into the wind, the, the French square riggers had a great deal of trouble combating them. And so the, uh, the French decided it needed to build some of these at uh, Toulon in the, in the Mediterranean. And it contacted the Spanish crown to get the assistance from some shipwrights who knew how to build these because the French did not. And as a result, a group of Menorcan shipwrights came to Toulon and assisted in the construction of four of these Jebecs. And there's another view of that. But let me show you one more, which shows the size of the model. I put a glove there. So we're talking about, let's see, I made a note here how long that thing is. The, the model itself is nine inches at the waterline and about a foot overall, a little more than a foot, 14 inches overall. So the, these Jebecs were particularly interesting because the Corsair, the North African versions, generally had a couple of big guns, maybe 24 pounders at, at the front, um, but no broadside. And the French wanted a broadside to overpower those, those Corsairs. And so they developed this system. The Jebec itself has a very steeply cambered deck and you simply couldn't effectively mount guns on that deck. They'd be pointing into the water. And so they overlaid gun platforms on that deck. But the, the reason the, the Jebec deck is so heavily cambered is because this is a very wet boat. It's low in the water, it's fast, and there's a lot of water. 
And so this, of course, this deck runs the water off and there's a scupper down there. In order to use these gun platforms, they also had to allow the water that would accumulate up there to run out. And so between each of the guns that they mounted, they installed gratings. And this is what they did. The uh, gratings are between each of the guns. In this instance, I was test fitting one of the cannon. And you will note the French method here of mounting the breaching, which is not around the caskable button as the British and Americans do, but through a hole in the carriage itself. And this, this particular breaching is far longer than, than the final. I was testing the, the length at this point, but this is the system and, and in and it puts a, a lot of strain on the uh, breaching at this point, but it is found in virtually every French warship of the period. So they seem to like it and they stick with it. Anyhow, that this is the gratings on the uh, platform. And here's a better view of all of it, or not all of it, but most of it, as it was uh, installed with the, with the guns installed. And one more view and another one of these sleds that I use when, when rigging. And a little bit of detail. This is the oven, different from the more, more advanced one. This, this ship dates to, I should have said at the beginning, 1750, Louis the Fifteenth, And so the stove, if you will, is, is rather crude. It's a five or six feet tall box with fire brick on the inside. Divided in two, the officers got on the uh, got their meals on the port side. The crew of two hundred got their meals here on the starboard. So, let me go back a second before that. When I mentioned on the previous ship, the two types of decoration, carving, and assemblage, a lot of decoration on this particular vessel, and so a lot of assemblage. Now, on the original ship, of course, a lot of this detail was painted. And on the model of the ship, which is the builder's model in the Musée de la, de la Marine in Paris, it's also painted. I don't want to paint. I enjoy woodwork. And so I did it in wood. And so these are the assemblages on the quarter deck panel, sort of below the quarter deck, but Roman, I think Roman rather than Greek symbols of war that seem to be a, a good idea for a warship. And of course, that's a Euro, my apologies to my British friends, but this was originally sent to some friends in, in France. So, and some of the detail on, on one of those. And this is some of the scroll or frilly work that is found around the, uh, the quarter deck as well. This is boxwood over ebony over pearwood on the inside. So those are the, the assemblages that are used on this ship. The carving, the three-dimensional carving uh, sorry about the quality of this one, but it began with the sort of equivalent of a figurehead. I'm not sure you can call it that, but it was the some Toulon shipbuilder's idea of what a shark looks like mounted on the front and uh, kind of a nasty looking thing, I suppose, intended to scare. And he's replicated at the head rail end. And then the animal theme continues at the break of the quarter deck there's a pair of lions that guard it. And uh, I don't have a closer close up, but that's, this is a uh, day. And at the stern, there was a crocodile, kind of a chubby little crocodile off the end of the boom. In addition at the, at this grating, which extends out for handling the boom, the side of that has, each side has the figure Renamé, renown or, fame 
blowing her horn and, and flying away. So she ends up uh, on either side. And then lastly, the stern, which is where most of the decoration occurs. And this has a couple of, to me, interesting elements. What we call a Turk's head, the enemy basically mounted on the top of the rudder with the uh, rudder itself operating through his mouth. This is pretty common in French ships of this period in the Mediterranean. You see this sort of, I, I think of it as thumbing their nose at the enemy, but you see this kind of decoration uh, quite commonly. Galleys in particular uh, have it. You have Louis XV's crossed L's below and then sort of a random thing. And then you have two chase gun ports that are nice, nice flower forms, I guess it could be, and some decoration along below that. At the top of the grating, and I apologize here because the, uh, the focal length didn't allow it, and it's, it's fuzzy, but you have this bas relief, which is of Amphitrite, the spouse of Poseidon, seated on a chair or carriage of some kind being pulled by a pair of dolphins and surrounded by her entourage of ladies. And I find it very amusing that the, uh, friend, the builders of this thing couldn't resist having uh, a Cupid type little guy who's getting out of there. He's flying away, and, but leaves his little rear end visible. So the back, that's the larger view of this. And then on either side, you have two more Turks heads, which are these guys. And again, it's just sort of thumbing the nose of the enemy, I think. This was the, the front break of the quarter deck with the bell set in there. And I it just uh, had it before I installed it. More of the, this kind of reversed C. Uh, I'm not sure what else to call it with flowers in between. And just a, a, an interesting note to me of building in this scale. One of my favorite tools are these very fine, small electrical clips, copper, so they're relatively soft and they are toothless. These are, these are flat finished and they're just very, very helpful. It's, it's very difficult to clamp at this scale. You really need to find things like this that are helpful. Ship's boats, uh, you've seen my method before. This is the ship's boat of this particular vessel and it has some very nice uh, decoration on the wash strake at the stern and uh, loaded with uh, oars and such. And then uh, topside now, rigging. The Latin rig, as, I, as, as you may well know, is, is, is a very interesting rig, but involves huge yards and sails. The yards themselves composed of of two long poles that are joined together and carry the sail. The, the, the main sail on the main yard on this ship was 120 feet long and according to the literature weighed two tons. So in order to maneuver something like that, you needed massive gear blocks. You need heavy gears and massive gear blocks. And that's what these were. This of course is on the foremast but you had a lower gear block that's fixed to the deck, an upper gear, gear block that's mobile, and the two are connected by six sheaves that give you pretty good motive power on that. The sheaves themselves, interestingly, on these are, and at the top of the mast are brass. The usual heavy wood simply wouldn't bear this weight. So I believe these were the main mast gear blocks under construction, nearly done. And here's the four mast head. You can see the doubled yard on this with a sail furled. The gears, which then come around the back and go to a toggle on the, on the yard, you can't see that. The, uh, 
interesting method of instead of using loops over the mast, they would double over the ends of shrouds and strop them in this manner. I assume that was reasonably effective. And uh, what's also interesting is this is a very poor picture, but the lower end of the shrouds have toggles rather than any other way of doing it, really. These toggles here are fixed, so there's no real way of adjusting it. You can remove them pretty readily, and that seems to be the purpose of these, but they absolutely uh, cannot be adjusted except further on up the mast at, the, at uh, where you might find a fiddle block such as this. This is an interesting one. This is a fiddle block, a triple fiddle block uh, of all things. And that was a bit of a challenge. So it's got a single upper and two lowers. I, again, I have to apologize for the quality of the picture. It's uh, the best I could do. So that is the Gibec. And then just a quick note on the last, which is a heavy frigate that has a kind of an interesting history. It was launched in 1799. This is this. I didn't have a neat picture uh, of the uh, Egyptian, but uh, La Forte, uh, the sister ship is identical. There were four of these built at the time. And the Egyptian then launched in 1799. At that point, uh, you may recall, Napoleon's troops were still in Egypt fighting the British and the Turks. And so its first assignment was to go across the Mediterranean to Alexandria to resupply the French troops that were there, which it did and ended up in the harbor at, at Alexandria, where shortly afterward, it was blockaded uh, along with several other ships by a British fleet. And while that was going on, the French troops on land agreed to surrender to the British and Turks. And uh, as a result of that surrender, they also agreed to turn over the ships that were in the Alexandria Harbor to the British fleet. And a consequence of which uh, the Egyptian was taken into the British Navy and became uh, HMS Egyptian. But what's interesting about all of this is that the ship was loaded for return to France when it was blockaded. And one of the items it was carrying was the recently discovered Rosetta Stone, which is why the Rosetta Stone is to be found in London rather than in Paris. And I really like that little bit of naval history. So I don't have much to show you here. This is the ship under construction. And at this point, it's mostly planked below the main whale with the pierwood. And when I get tired of planking, I start playing with the figurehead. The figurehead is this lovely Egyptian princess who is admiring herself in a mirror that she's holding as princesses are wont to do. So I just started on this and it's, this is where it is today, uh, but it will eventually be that princess. And that is it. That's my uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm.